for Schools. Today we're pleased to be joined by Stephen Morales, Chief Executive of the Institute of School Business Le Leadership, for the first of three webinars we're running together on financial management in schools. Today's webinar is looking at the funding and accountability framework. An important aim of the Institute is to bring together the different pillars of school leadership, pedagogy, governance and business, so that schools are better placed to improve pupil outcomes. And to that end, we hope that as a result of this webinar series, you as governors will have a clearer idea of working effectively with the school business professionals in your organisation. Before I hand over to Stephen, can I just check that everyone can hear me uh, by asking you to select the raise hand icon on your webinar console? That's great, I can see lots of raised hands, so I think that means we're all set. Um, the slides for this webinar are available to download uh, from your uh, webinar console in PDF format, and a video of the webinar will be available on our website shortly afterwards. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Stephen. Okay, um, good afternoon. Um, uh, thank you very much um, for that introduction. Um, I'll just start off by saying that um, the, the, the pace of this uh, this webinar uh, it's going to ebb and flow a little bit. There's some there's some sections uh, which, by their very nature, are a little bit slow and a bit clunky. Um, I I, uh, I can only apologise for for trying to deliver um, content around the national funding formula. It, it, it's in and of itself it's uh, it, it's complex and and quite unwieldy. But beyond that, we, we can have a, a decent discussion around um, the some of the challenges that exist within the sector, um, some of the opportunities for school business leadership, the um, uh, the the role of the um, uh, leadership triangle, pedagogy, business, and governance working seamlessly together, uh, and we can talk a little bit about the difference between the maintained and the academy sector and the accountability frameworks. So um, uh, notwithstanding some uh, bearing with me for some of the, the more boring detail around the, 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 uh, the constructs of the national funding formula, we should be get, able to get into some, some, some more, um, more interesting discussion items and I'd be happy to take questions as we go through. Um, so um, what we're going to try and cover today, um, essentially we're going to talk about funding and accountability, the differences between SATs, MATs and maintained schools, uh, what you should be looking out for as, as governors um, and uh, what bearing does our school organisational context have in terms of the kinds of business professionals that we want in our organisations and uh, what that role uh, might look like and it, it is different depending on the, the the kind of the kind of structure that we're uh, examining so um, let's start by asking the question what is the national funding formula and it's pretty straightforward it's the method that government uses to decide how much money should be given to English state schools now, historically, there were many factors in excess of 120, 130 factors. Um, and, and within those factors, there were some really quite, uh, quite silly things. Uh, for example, if the grass grew at a greater speed in one area of the country, i.e. where it rained more, uh, then there was a waiting to, to accommodate that. Um, so if you can imagine if you imagine that, that things like that were being considered, you can imagine the plethora of other things that found their way into the formula. Very unwieldy, um, almost impossible to ensure equity uh, across the country. And those factors stuck for many years and funding was increased on a spend plus basis. Uh, so, you know what you got last year was then increased uh, by a cost of living uh, value or something similar uh, and you know for for over a decade that's the way that the, the system was moving the other thing to say is that um, 
you know, within those factors were uh, were, were some contextual um, uh, values. So, for example, inner city schools in London were attracting additional money for deprivation uh, when they were deprived areas. Some of those areas have become very gentrified uh, over the last 10 years and so perhaps uh, don't have the same need that, that they did but nevertheless the, um, the factors didn't adjust accordingly. So um, over the last few years um, and I've been working with, with government on the national funding formula now for, for well over a decade but certainly over the last couple of years there's been a real move towards a national funding formula. Um, we saw the, the, the implementation of a new national funding formula uh, just a couple of years ago and we're in what's called a soft phase. Now what that means is that there is um, there is no obligation for local authorities to follow the new national funding formula, however many of them are, um, uh, but, it's, but it's there in the background um, and the ambition is that we move to a hard formula in the not too distant future and if we can get Brexit out of the way and start to pass some legislation uh, then we've got half a chance of moving to a hard implementation. Um, in terms of um, what can we expect uh, uh, for the future of the national funding formula? Well, we, we had we had a view, um, and I'll caveat this statement um, because we've had a big announcement uh, just this weekend. So we, we were of the view that um, national funding formula arrangement would remain broadly um, as they uh, as they are at the moment, um, with the soft arrangements in place. Uh, principally due to a delay to the comprehensive spending review, the uncertainty around Brexit and a one-year budget settlement. And then we thought, okay, so beyond that, 21-22, uh, uh, we might see the hard implementation, um, something that as an institute we've been pushing for because we do want to, to iron out any inequity as, as, soon, as, as soon as possible. I'll talk a little bit later about the role of uh, uh, schools forum and the influence that they have locally because some people are under the impression just because government decide on a national funding formula and delegate money down to a local authority level that everyone receives uh, um, uh, funds in the same way and they don't. The influence that uh, uh, that the, well, the flexibility first that local authority have, and the influence that uh, schools forum can can uh, can have on on those decisions means that uh, you know one local authority with similar with children of similar characteristics could be receiving quite different sums of money depending on what the emphasis is. But we'll, we'll, we'll revisit that um, later on in the presentation. Um, so anyway, this 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 weekend this weekend uh, things changed uh, quite significantly in terms of what we can expect. Uh, for school funding. Um, the Prime Minister's made some very bold announcements, um, probably due to pressure from uh, MPs and indeed uh, the uh, teacher unions. Um, so the announcement, the announcements that were made as a package of uh, increased spending in the public sector, uh, interestingly that the, the, the announcement uh, talks about a one-year spending round uh, and that's the case for most public sector departments. But interesting, there's a three-year commitment uh, for schools. So uh, what was announced was um, uh, up 2.6 billion in 2020, 2021, up another 2.2 billion in 2021-22, uh, um, up 2.3 billion for 22-23. Uh, five thousand pounds for secondary schools uh, as a minimum, um, and for primaries a uh, a move over the next three years from three thousand five hundred per pupil up to four thousand per pupil. Um, and this is all part of the the the, the levelling up rhetoric that that, that we heard, um, I believe, on the first day that uh, Prime Minister Johnson was in in office. Um, as, a, as an institute, we, um, we're very keen to make sure that um, 
that not only are those uh, those sums that have been committed to um, you know that the commitment is is upheld, but but also that there is a proper distribution mechanism, um, and the devil will, will be in the detail. So we'll be working very closely with officials on the uh, on on the details of, of that. In fact, um, that there is a group of of stakeholders, including unions, associations, um, and local authorities, that work very closely with officials on making sure that there are no unintended consequences of some of these high level policy decisions. Um, but that's 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 to come and obviously this is this is hot off the press uh of course we welcome the additional funding we just want to make sure that that it gets to 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 the right to the right place so that's uh, just uh, some background in terms of uh, funding if we get into um if we get into the current current funding system uh, and how it works uh, and apologies if if uh, if i'm teaching you to to suck eggs here but but i think it's important that we we do um, go back to basics in terms of uh, how the um, funding system works and then we work our way through. So um, so core revenue is distributed via something called the um, Dedicated Schools Grant or DSG. Um, the DSG is split into four blocks, the schools block, the high needs block, the early years block and the central services blocks. Uh, and then there's some flexibilities for local authorities to move funds uh between those between those blocks uh, um other education funding and we'll just uh we'll, we'll just skirt over this but just just i think it's important to mention uh 16 to 19 funding um there's still money for schools uh as part of the academy pipeline so pre and post opening grants um and sponsored academies and free and new free schools there, there, there's there's funding available uh for those schools uh there are other some other bespoke specific grants and um capital funding is clearly separate from revenue funding but we'll go into uh into that in a bit more detail later on okay in terms of the um the the schools block um so the schools block is made up of um uh, 15 factors um you'll see that you know i talked about the 100 and the 120 130 factors that used to exist and how unwieldy that was uh we, we've now got the factors down to a, a a much more sensible much more manageable number um and, and they're made up um those, those 15 factors are you can break them down into uh, some some broad headings so you've got basic basic per pupil funding You've got additional needs funding, school-led funding, geographic funding, and then other factors. So if we go through the detail, uh, if we start with basic per pupil funding, um, so there's basic entitlement, and this assigns funding on the basis of individual pupils. There's a minimum level of funding per pupil, uh, and this allows LAs to provide amounts up to the minimum per pupil level of funding in terms of additional needs funding uh, there is a, a factor that cons considers deprivation so local authorities can use free school meals or IDACI which is the income deprivation affecting children index or both proxy indicators to calculate deprivation factor uh, there's something called prior attainment uh, and prior attainment acts as a proxy indicator for low level, high incident special educational needs. There's a factor uh, called uh, looked after children factor. Local authorities can apply a single unit value for any child who has been looked after for one day or more, or is recorded on something called the LASSD A903 return. Bit of a mouthful, but nevertheless, uh, there it is. Um, other additional um, needs funding, English is an additional language, pupils identified in, in the October census um, with a first language other than English may attract funding for up to three years after they enter the statutory school system. Pupil mobility, this covers pupils who entered a school during the last three academic years 
but did not start in August or September. Moving on to school-led funding, um, there is a factor for sparsity and the elig eligibility is as follows. Schools located in areas where pupils would have to travel a significant distance to get to an alternative school where there are no alternatives or they are small schools. Lump sum, uh, local authorities can set a flat lump sum for all phases or differentiate the sum for primary and secondary. The maximum lump sum is 175,000. And lump sum really was all about uh, those schools that had such a small intake that they weren't viable without this um, this additional funding. Their, pup their per pupil funding alone would have not have made them sustainable. Split sites. Um, so split sites are designed to support schools that have unavoidable extra costs because the school buildings are on separate sites and you can imagine logistically how complicated and costly that can be. Uh, and rates, this is very much an in and out, so local authorities must fund rates at their estimate of actual rate costs. The last couple of school-led factors, uh, private finance initiatives designed to support schools that have extra premises costs due to PFI and exceptional premises. Um, it's a factor that was, uh, that was designed so that local authorities can apply to the ESFA to use exceptional factors related to school premises. But nearly there. I did. I did warn you that uh, some of this detail is 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 a bit a bit tedious. But but we're getting through there. Um, geography. Um, so the, a ge geographic factor. The remaining geographic factor in in the formula now is something called London Fringe. And the purpose of this factor is to support schools that have higher costs because they're in the London Fringe area. So where um, housing and salary costs are um, make it incredibly difficult to retain um and attract teachers um there, there is a waiting to to accommodate uh for that and um and then finally the the, the last of the 15 factors um is the funding floor and this is designed to allow local authorities to reflect nff calculations of a minimum one percent per pupil increase over 2018-19 uh, baselines Okay, so that that's essentially the 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 school block in uh, in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to move on to to high needs now. Um, high needs again, the the probably the, the second most significant of the of the funding blocks. So it's important that we uh, that we cover this. Um, it's it, the, the high needs funding formula is quite complex, but what I'm going to hopefully provide you is is with a uh, um, some headline. Um, information um, and, and you'll get a sense of, of, of how it works. So uh, um, what does high needs, uh, what, what's high needs funding all about? Well it supports um, uh, learners from from 0 to 25 with special educational needs or disabilities, it supports those excluded or otherwise not able, able to attend school, it supports alternative provision for children and young people, including pupil referral units and hospital schools. Um, just for the, the sake of clarity, a, ch a child is deemed to have high needs if their educational costs, if their education costs more than £10,000 per year. Um, and and funding is allocated to local authorities based on past spending patterns. Um, and the distribution of high needs funding has two main components. So there's core funding and there's uh, and there's top up funding. And the table I'm going to show you now kind of uh, um, hopefully illustrates uh, what we mean there. So if you look at if you look at the type of provision, uh, mainstream schools, mainstream academies, um, the core funding um, uh, available to, to, to schools comes in the form of uh, first 6,000 of additional support costs. It's delegated within the school budgets derived from the local formula 
and the local authority have a, have a duty to ensure it, it's sufficient. And then there is um, top up funding uh, available, but agreed uh, by the commissioning local authority. Now, as you move through the, the, the type of provision, so if we move now to special uh, special units um, and resource provision in mainstream schools and the same in academies, uh, you'll see that there is a 10,000 per place um, allocation and then top up agreed again by the local uh, commissioning authority. Uh, if we look at maintained special schools, special academies, non-maintained special schools, again, 10,000 per place based on number of places to be funded and then any top up agreed by the local uh, commissioning authority. Uh, and if we look at pupil referral units, uh, uh, then the, the same 10,000 per, per place based on number of places to be funded and again any top up agreed by the local authority. So um, we get a sense there of, of, of how um, high needs funding uh, and, and high needs funding works. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot more to say about about that, but I couldn't do justice to 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 high needs in the time that I've got. So I just wanted to give you some of the some of the headlines. Um, there is a funding block um, called early years. Uh, I, I mentioned at the start of this presentation that we're not going to go into that. Um, just be aware that there is a, a block uh, dedicated to, to to that area of, of education. Um, so we'll move straight on to to capital. Um, so the Department for Education allocates funding to help maintain and improve the condition of school buildings and grounds. And, and funding is made up of uh, funding is made up of two broad categories: uh, school condition allocations and devolved formula capital. Um, capital funding includes allocations for local authorities and local authority maintained schools, for local voluntary aided bodies and local and voluntary aided schools, academies and large multi-academy trusts and sponsors, sixth form colleges, special schools not maintained by the local authority, special post-16 institutions with eligible students. Now it's important to state that single academy trusts and small multi-academy trusts must apply via something called the Condition Improvement Fund. Um, now, this is a um, this is a fund that, that that's available through a bid process, uh, so there are no guarantees. Um, um, many uh, many academies have chosen to uh, to, to use a um, a contractor, a surveyor. A, uh, a specialist uh, organization to uh, to bid on their behalf uh, one because the construction of the bid the quality the robustness of the bid will depend on the uh, the technical knowledge that uh, that the that the, the the scriber has so um, to outsource it uh, sometimes both in terms of time and technical mastery it, it makes it makes economic sense of course there's a commission that you have to concede um, but the likelihood of being successful through that route is uh, almost always uh, much greater than if you try and do it do it yourself however not, not uh, that, that isn't to say that if you have particular expertise uh, in-house then uh, please take advantage of them um, other points to consider um, that local authorities have a duty to ensure school buildings are in a suitable condition. Um, it's important to, 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 to note that. Um, and it's important to do the due diligence when schools are considering uh, joining a joining a mat, um, uh, both in terms of uh, the exposure that you might have in the future to capital maintenance um, and to ensure that it, you're able to access any funding or you have the capacity to access any funding that you might need going forward. Quite often, as part of the due diligence process, um, governors, school leadership teams, finance uh, uh, professionals uh, forget to look at, at, at that piece of the, of the puzzle, and sometimes it can come back and bite them down the track. So, so important to, to consider that. Um, 
schools can make urgent requests to the local authority or the ESFA for smaller for smaller mats if, if something occurs which may cause uh, classroom closure. And again, not many not many schools are aware of that. Um, you, you can push that issue very hard. If you're not able to to um, to use a classroom, um, you can make the case and uh, and you should do. Um, as an institute, we have developed some good estate management guidance and uh, through our website, we, we, we can give you access to that if you'd like more detail. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, in terms of the construction of bids, uh, don't be afraid to use professionals um, to support your whole approach to, um, to capital and estates management. Okay, so we're going to move on to, to accountability now um, and hopefully try to, uh, uh, to provide an understanding of the difference between the maintained sector and, uh, and academies. Um, so we know that there are state funded schools fall into two main groups, uh, maintained schools where funding and oversight is through the local authority and academies where funding and oversight is from the Department of Education uh, via the ESFA. Um, academies are owned and run by not-for-profit private trusts. Trusts register as companies with the company with Companies House and are subject to company law. Um, they're controlled and funded directly directly by central government by means of a contract. Um, this is called a funding agreement. Um, and that, that, that funding agreement contract is a contract that, that exists between the trust and the Secretary of State. This is clearly different to maintain schools, essentially run by a governing body in accordance with statutory education law. In some cases, the trust runs a single standalone academy under contract, and some trusts run a number of academies known as multi-academy trusts. So you can see there quite a quite a significant distinction between the, uh, the types of schools that we that we are experiencing within our within our systems within our system academies including free schools are directly accountable to the secretary of state while all other state funded schools are accountable to local authorities both are inspected by ofsted in theories academy in theory academies have more freedom than other state schools over their finances, the curriculum, teachers and teachers paying conditions. A key difference is that they are funded directly by central government instead of receiving their funds via a local authority. Academy trusts are classified as part of central government. Important to note that. <clears throat> Maintain schools use CFR codes uh, for their accounting um, records. They follow local authority accounting guidance and procedures. Um, the oversight comes from a local uh, a local governing body. Uh, there are a number of subcommittees, almost always a finance committee. Um, audits take place on an ad hoc basis, uh, often not annual. In fact, very rarely are they annual. And financial reporting and statutory accounting is via the local authority. The next, next slide uh, just goes over some of the ground that we've already covered, so I'm not going to uh, read through the list, um, but you'll see there that um, there are some fundamental components um, that, you, that you'll that you see with all academies, funding agreement, academies, financial handbook, made up of members and trustees and, and so forth. Okay, so bearing in mind that we have a mixed economy of schools, we have uh, different uh, accountability arrangements, um there are different um uh different governance structures um we're going to talk now a little bit about um organizational design and, and what works for your particular institution um if i start with the, the concept of the pooling of budgets um so in some circumstances it's um 
it's 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 reasonable to consider the the value of pooling your resources, bringing all of your resources together, um, and removing duplication. Uh, um, looking for uh, synergy in, in in what's being done. Um, looking to centralise functions um, and, and achieve economies of scale. Um, now, what some multi academy trusts have done is they've done exactly that. They've pulled their budgets. They've created a central services uh, function. Um, they, um, they 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 top slice. Uh, or, or, or develop a, a kind of levy uh, to each of the schools within the trust. The idea being that they take away all of the uh, all of the pain uh, for non non teaching non pedagogical activity uh, and provide a service to a group of schools. Um, the idea being that um, that you can optimize the resources that are going to frontline teaching and learning and avoid wasting money where it's unnecessary uh, by duplicating effort so you don't have in a small mass of between I don't know five and ten schools you don't replicate payroll HR procurement um, and so forth you you centralize those functions you take a small uh, element of the uh, per pupil funding from that school, um, you aggregate it and you provide those services at a much more uh, uh, a much more um, efficient uh, rate. Um, absolutely recognise that um, that size does matter um, and scale matters. So. This, those kind of arrangements work very well um, for medium and larger size mats. Um, uh, the, the case is, is not as strong for, for very small mats um, and um, certainly unworkable for, for standalones, unless um, it, you know, groups of standalone schools are coming together with um, soft arrangements where, for example, they may choose to to share the burden of procurement or share the burden of payroll or, or HR. Uh, and there are some cases where that works. But in the main, the medium to larger size mats are, are, are seeing the benefit of, uh, of, of, of pooling of budgets and, and, and central services. Um, um, <clears throat> but, but, you know, we, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that uh, whilst there are some things you can centralise very effectively, uh, some local arrangements need to be preserved for, for good reason. And what we don't want is no local business support where the head teacher in a local uh, context is, is running around uh, the school dealing with maintenance matters or, or, or showing contractors around uh, around the building and you know completely distracted from the core function of of, of teaching and learning. So um, that moves us neatly on to school business leadership in, in, in context um, and uh, I start with this with this first image of, of general administration. You know, it, it's perhaps the um, the historic view of the school business manager, a um, bit of a catch-all, an administrator, compliance officer type type function. But I think that um, um, that, that that image is is, is slowly um, slowly. Um, diminishing and, and 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 clearly, school business leaders do a lot more than just general admin and compliance. Um, they 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 perform a very strategic role. Um, and within our community, we have everything from uh, uh, finance officers through to deputy CEOs uh, and, and everything in between. So it's a very broad church. It's a broad spectrum of practice. Uh, there isn't one iteration of school business uh, uh, management or school business leadership um, that is a proxy for for the rest of the profession. Um, and indeed, as we as we see the the, the system evolve, it requires different skill sets, um, different technical specialism, 
different uh, approaches to, to, to leadership. Um, this diagram hopefully uh, shows how that tension um, is playing out. Um, so it's very common now to see uh, a executive structure presiding over a group of schools. So where historically we might have had a head teacher, an SLT and a business manager in a single uh, single setting context. Uh, we now have an executive team made up of a chief executive, chief operating officer, perhaps a finance director, HR director, a school improvement director, um, with peripheral vision, with a helicopter view across a group of schools, with heads of learning, local SLT arrangements, and business business support. And one could argue that this is replicated at a governance level as well. So we've got local gov governance arrangements, and we've got uh, a board of directors, um, trustees uh, presiding over the entire structure. The challenge is how do we take um, individuals who are used to the local context uh, to in, and develop them into executive leaders, uh, both from a pedagogical perspective and from a business support perspective. Um, and I have to say, when we've done the analysis across the system, there remains quite a significant skills gap in terms of that shift from local management to um, to executive executive leadership. We also mustn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So the, the the local arrangements, so the local management teams um, and their integrity is is really important. If you start pushing everything into uh, into the centre, uh, you end up with hugely vulnerable. Um, structures at, at a local level and you can find people with the uh, people being deployed to the wrong areas of activity you can as i described earlier you can find head teachers um taking responsibility for finance and hr and maintenance um because they can't get access to the central services for, uh, facilities quickly enough um, um and likewise if you completely rip the guts out of any kind of administrative uh function then um, things will will slip through the cracks and uh, expose the whole the whole trust. So it's all about balance, uh, the balance in terms of the structure that you decide on, and balance in terms of uh, you know, moving people through um, through the organisational hierarchy at a pace which they they're ready and comfortable to cope with. Um, so. With that in mind, um, as an institute, we've developed the, the, the concept of flavours of leadership. And uh, what we're seeing emerging are, are, are three broad, uh, three broad, broad flavours. Um, so those that are gravitating to executive roles, uh, those that want to specialise. Um, an example would be HR or finance or procurement. And then those that uh, continue to perform a more generalist role, maybe not 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 with the deep technical mastery of the specialist, but but a good working knowledge across a group of group of activities. And and I and I have to say that uh, that it's very um, it's it's absolutely right that in some cases those flavours are interchangeable. So you will see executive specialist, uh, a chief finance officer, is an executive specialist. Uh, you may see a executive generalist, uh, a chief operating officer would be an example of, a, uh, of an executive generalist. Uh, and then you may see local, local specialists as well, less common, but you may see uh, in some, some context a standalone setting that has decided that actually it would like to have its own HR uh, manager or in situ. So those, those flavours are, are interchangeable. I think as the um, as the system evolves um, and as new opportunities present themselves or even threats, it's important that um, school leaders, governors um, take stock uh, of of their of their organisations of their of their institutions. Um, and this is a tool that we've we've, we've developed. Uh, it's it's quite crude. It's just Excel. Um, it, it, it asks groups from the um, the uh, leadership triangle of pedagogy, business and governance to reflect um, in terms of their own knowledge and capacity across 
the areas of procurement, human resources, marketing, finance, um, and HR. Uh, and and uh, what we see uh, is is a heat map. Uh, what emerges is a, is a heat map. And actually, it doesn't matter if if one particular group doesn't have the skills and competencies um, to lead in an area. Um, so, for example, if we look at this uh this this uh, this slide we'll see that the head teacher um has admitted that you know really they're not they're not strong in any of those areas they're not you know they're good pedagogical leaders but but they're not strong in procurement human resources marketing and finance it, it th that's fine as long as somewhere else in the structure that's covered off so when we look down, we can see that the finance director is um, is an expert in in procurement, um, is an expert in finance. So the fact that the head teacher isn't an expert isn't a problem. If we look across uh, that group again, we see that the deputy head, in fact, is um, it has advanced knowledge of human resources. So so the very the very fact that if one group doesn't have the knowledge someone else does means that uh you you, you have resilience as an organization that's fine um but when you do this exercise if you do find gaping holes or or or, or lots of red um so lots of lots of uh areas where there is limited or no knowledge um then you can start to take steps to 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 address that now it may be that be becoming part of a, of a group of schools, part of a collaborative structure, will address that. It may be that you have particular strengths in in one or two areas, and a school or group of schools that you're going to work with have strength in other areas. So again, you, you, you're, you're covered. Um, the point is to understand where your strengths, weaknesses, and vulnerabilities are, and that you can respond. In, in in accordance with the information that you get from from this fairly straightforward exercise it is no surprise at all and it is no accident uh, that that competency framework has emerged from our professional standards our professional standards were published in 2015 and uh, revised uh, just a few months ago um, we took what the National College had developed uh, back in the mid 2000s, uh, which was a leadership competency framework for school business leaders. And we went beyond generic leadership uh, competencies and started to drill down into the technical areas that, uh, that are required to, to run a, a school, a group of schools, multi academy trust, a cooperative a federation and so forth um, and for each of the technical areas uh, we have a uh, a a tier uh, tier one being um, somebody contributing to a function and tier four being strategically leading now, clearly you are, um, if you are a strategic leader if you're a chief finance officer chief operating officer uh, an aspiring chief executive then we would expect you to have more uh, more of the um, the competencies at uh, level four strategic leadership uh, and perhaps less of the less of the uh, actual um, doing competencies as, as it were so 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 we we accommodate through the professional standards that journey from uh, contributor supervisor manager through to strategic leader. The, the closer you are to an executive role, the more competency we want competency we want to see in that strategic leadership space. Uh, the more you're involved in middle management, we want to see um, um, uh, hands on coal face type competency. And clearly, if you're starting your journey, then you're making a contribution to a function. We want you to develop a working knowledge of the activity that you're involved in. Um, so we we believe we we we're accommodating that broad church that I talked about before. Um, this document itself is accessible through our website. It's a it's quite a detailed and lengthy document. So in order to make things easier for employers, uh, governors, 
and indeed uh, other members of the strategic leadership team, we've developed a head teacher and governance guide. Um, and this takes you through the various areas of the professional standards, um, but not in the deep forensic way that you perhaps would if you were a practitioner yourself. But it'll help you, one, assess the competency of uh, the school business leaders that you've got uh, in post. And, uh, and secondly, when you're thinking about, uh, about recruiting, you'll have a reference point against which to, uh, to recruit. Now you can find that um, professional standards guidance document through the web link uh, at the bottom of the page there on the, on the right hand side. So that's my quick canter through, um, through accountability, school business leadership and uh, the, uh, the funding formula. Um, I think we've got some time, uh, if I'm not mistaken, to, to take some questions. Um, so I'm going to have a go at, um, at responding to some of the things that I think have, uh, have, have come in. So just bear with me a second while I try and figure out how to, how to bring up all of the questions. Okay, so I've just picked up a question here um, about uh, academies and, and, and the question is, are academies being funded according to the NFF right now in the soft phase? Well, the, the, the straightforward answer is, is, is yes. Um, so uh, just, just, just for the sake of, of clarification, and, and sometimes there's been some confusion here, what, what essentially happens is that the, um, the funding arrangements for, for both academies and maintained schools um, it is, takes place at a local authority level. Um, all that happens is that for, a, for an academy that that agreed formula at a local level goes back up to the ESFA and the ESFA then paid the academy directly. For local authority schools, the, uh, the money comes straight from the local authority. But the decisions that are made by the local authority with schools forum will affect both academies and maintain schools so there's no you're not immune if you're an academy from decisions made at schools forum level the 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 problem we've got at the moment is that although there's a national funding formula and many local authorities are fo following that national funding formula local authorities can can go off piste if you like they can deviate and they can decide that actually they're going to put a greater emphasis on primary than secondary they're going to put more uh, into SEN interventions uh, and, and so forth. So, so two sets of schools, two different local authorities could find that they end up with different um, funding allocations depending on, on what decisions are made locally. That's before you get into what has been agreed nationally for that particular local authority area. So, um, and, and that's the point of uh, the hard formula. Once we get to a hard formula, we'll start to iron out these discrepancies and these, um, if you like, these these local uh, these local deviations. So hopefully that's uh, that's responded to to that question. Uh, there's a question about whether I'll be circulating the uh, the, the the slides. Uh, yeah, I believe I believe so. The organisers at uh, Governors of Schools, uh, I believe, will be making those those available. I'm very happy for. Everybody, everybody should have a copy. Yeah, I and mean, there's a question here that I, th I think it, I think it's asking the question about the. The scores that uh, that are in the uh, competency um, the competence, competency Excel spreadsheet. Uh, I, I should should make it absolutely clear. Those, those scores are just illustrative, so they're, they're they're not they're not real. 
um, and they're not designed to be a guide for anybody. Um, what what we would what would be be advocating is that you've got across your the pillars of governance, business, and um, and pedagogy that you've got uh, uh, high levels of skills and competency across all of those disciplines. Of course, we would expect um, the school business leader who is charged with uh, financial oversight to be scoring quite high in those areas of procurement and finance. Um, we would expect the head teacher to have a working knowledge of budgets, but not deep forensic knowledge. And of course, the chair of finance within the governing body um, or, or the board of, of trustees, again, to be uh, competent in that area. Um, if, if that isn't the case, then um, you know that, that, would, that should set off uh, alarm bells and um, you should be taking steps to make sure that uh, you either um, upskill, train, develop or recruit um, additional resource into your organisation. Or um, if you're going to be part of a collaborative structure, it may be, as I said, that, that that's covered off in, in that way. Um, th uh, there's a question here about how do you get access to the ISBL capacity audit tool? Uh, very, very happy to make that available through um, Governors for Schools, or uh, you can drop us a line at uh, info at isbl.org.uk or, or to me personally, uh, stephen.morales at isbl.org.uk. Uh, either of those routes, uh, we, can, we can get it to you. But yeah, absolutely happy to share that. Okay, there's a question here about the interaction between the uh, school business manager and, and governors. I, I think that's a, that's a very fair, it's a very fair question. My um, my response to that is that uh, there should be uh, there should be no at a, at a strategic level there should be no time when school business leaders um, are being excluded from the conversation. Are, are, when it comes to uh, curriculum design, resource allocation, the construction of the uh, of the budget, uh, the strategic three-year plan, uh, what you want is the school business leader, the um, the head teacher, and the governing body in the room together. Um, we far too often see groups operating in silos, so. The finance lead constructing a budget um, uh, based on trying to trying to achieve a balanced budget. The um, the head teacher working with the timetabling lead uh, developing a curriculum which is meeting um, the particular curriculum ambition. Uh, quite right, but it needs to be done in the context of affordability and sustainability, um, and then often governors brought into the conversation after the uh, after the event and we don't want that either so what we want is we want uh, appropriate consideration for the resources that are available and not only in this year but for the next two or three years we want uh, a curriculum plan which has um, which is uh, which is ambitious um, and, and and in its own way quite stretch uh, where there potentially could be some concessions, but also agree on some red lines. Uh, and then we want uh, a governing body that is well cited in terms of the assumptions that are being made around the construction of the budget and uh, um, and with, uh, with 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 due uh, with 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 due attention to. Uh, um, to the resources and the um, and the talent that's available to deliver that that ambition. So it needs to be properly joined up, um, and that can't happen if people are operating in in, in in silos. So hope that hope that answers that that question. Um, a, a question here: can, can an SBM also be a clerk to to governors? Well. Um, Yes, it, there are examples of that. Um, I, I, I think it's actually better 
to uh, to keep the clerk a little bit more more independent. I, I think where the clerk role and the school business leader um, uh, interact and interface uh, better is the quite often the the, the school business leader is the uh, company secretary um so we'll be responsible for collating uh and putting together statutory returns and monthly management accounts and, and so forth uh, and we'll, we'll need to work seamlessly with the clerk to governors to ensure that uh information is 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 flowing in a timely and efficient way um but i think th that level of independence that the clerk brings to the governance arrangements is really important the, cl the clerk is much more than just a minute taker and, and a clerk should be making sure that that everybody is aware of their of their responsibilities that they have the latest uh guidance in terms of statutory obligations charity commission company's house anything that the um um that the academy uh, financial assurance framework um uh, requires governors to be uh, uh up to speed with so yeah i, I it, it's possible but i think it, it, it's better if you can keep keep um keep those two roles uh, segregated Um, there's a question here about uh, the, the comment on uh, pupil mobility. So um, the the important the important thing for pupil mobility is the the date which the children um, start and leave school. Um, and um, uh, so uh, you know when we when when we have when we have children leaving the school. Uh, leaving school in the middle of a year uh, that's what um, is a trigger for um, for that 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 mobility funding and it, and if we're seeing groups of school groups of children serially moving um, mid year um, then then clearly that has quite significant quite a significant impact on a school's on a school's funding um, um because because in the end a you know your uh your financial position depends on children uh children the children on roll, roll completing uh completing the the academic year and if you're not getting your funding because children are moving constantly uh for uh for demographic reasons um then then clearly um the school needs to be compensated as, as, as a consequence. Um, so there's a question here, very good question about can a school appeal in any way against the decision of the local forum? Um, a school on its own can't, I mean, there, there are a number of things to, to, to bear in mind. First of all, it's really important that you identify your, it's really important that you identify your schools forum representative. Everybody, all schools have a schools forum representative. Many schools don't know who that is. Uh, once you've done that, um, you can hold your representative to account by, um, by uh, asking, Firstly, that they represent your views, but secondly, um, ensuring that they can provide evidence that they've done so. Um, schools Forum themselves don't really have any legal teeth. This is one of the problems. Um, so the local authority um, are required to consult with Schools Forum, but they don't necessarily have to listen to what Schools Forum have to say. Now, if Schools Forum have a particular view and a very strong view, um, it wouldn't be sensible for a local authority to completely ignore what schools forum are saying. However, they could, uh, and in some cases they do. Um, um, so there isn't really any legal recourse. I think it's more about uh, 
accountability and uh, representation. So, you know, develop a relationship with your local rep, make sure that there's a dialogue going backwards and forwards, both in terms of what you want the local rep, your local rep to say and what they're going to feed back to you after they've been to Schools Forum. If you're not happy about the way that Schools Forum are being managed, so there are some um, there are some guidelines that local authority have to abide by in terms of secretariat agenda, the um, the timeliness of information, uh, the minute taking process, and so forth, and the representation on schools forum. So there are things that you can that you can challenge in that regard. In terms of decisions, it's quite difficult to um, to challenge or to overturn something that the local authority are very wedded to. So hopefully that that answers that question for you. Um, I think we're, we're out of time, that's, that, that's an hour now. Uh, I hope in some way that's been, that's been useful. Um, please get in touch with me at, uh, at the Institute if you like to discuss anything further and uh, through uh, Governors for Schools um, I'll make sure that, that the documents that you've asked for access to are made available to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you for attending uh, our first webinar. Um, just a reminder that the slides are available to download from your consoles and they will be available on our website um, soon. Um, next week, uh, we're looking at the principles of effective financial governance again with Stephen, so hopefully we'll see you there. Thanks very much.